Jeremy, uh, do you mind if I record this conversation uh, and then use it uh, as a four-minute interview together with other key opinion leaders for our blog? No, it's a pleasure. Great pleasure. So, uh, can you briefly introduce yourself? Alex, my name is Jeremy Levin. I am the chairman and CEO of Ovid Therapeutics and the chairman of Bio Innovation Organization. Uh, thank you. Uh, so you are one of the key opinion leaders in biotechnology in general, and uh, you're extremely well known. Um, you are familiar with all the problems that the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industry is facing. Uh, it looks like the FDA had a record year last year approving you know, just over 50 drugs, and that's a second in the, in the past 20 years. Uh, what do you see as the major problems in uh, pharmaceutical research and development, and why is the yield so low? It's a complex question, and it's an even more complex answer. However, it starts with the concept of deriving innovation. Where does it come from? As you know, the pharmaceutical industry suffered tremendously over the years in driving innovation. And at the same time as the biotechnology industry grew, so it took over being essentially the engine of innovation. The result is that today, over 70% of all new compounds that are in the pharmaceutical industry are derived from small, nimble companies in the, in the biotechnology industry. However, that doesn't mean that the pharmaceutical industry could not itself be very innovative. There are companies that do that. One of the difficulties with this, however, is that most pharmaceutical companies were a very risk averse about going into completely novel areas. And the consequence of this is that their pipelines often duplicate each other uh, in their own research. So they take low risk, so-called uh, approaches to targets that are well-established, well-known and pursue them. So I think there are really several complex, difficult problems to analyze. One is what is biotech provide that pharma doesn't? And two, what leads to the culture that seeks to have less risk adverse early stage programs? Where they are superlative, Alex, is in late stage development and commercialization. So, and why do you think uh, they take the safe route betting on known targets? Uh, and going after the same targets uh, uh, at the same time, which is, to me, it looks uh, very strange. Uh, what, what, what is uh, driving this behavior? It's the desire for success, and it's the, mis the misplaced assumption that if you have a target that is novel and is unproven, the chances of success go down. Now, generally that's the case given the tools that have been available to us over the years. And there are many, many, many targets. The question is how do you decide which is the ideal target to go after? And in order for you to invest money on a target, you really have to have a, either the risk profile of a biotech company, which is succeed or fail, or you need to have tools that allow you to have a reasonable certitude that your investment in that target will lead to a product in a larger company. It's not only the technologies, it's also the culture. So even companies that are highly focused on driving and getting new targets will inevitably drift towards a low risk position if left to do it. So it's, I think there really, there's a cultural aspect there's a technological aspect, and there's also a desire for an understanding of whether the leadership of that company wants to see their company as an innovative company or one that is a follower. Very important aspects, and it permeates the company from the top to the bottom. Uh, that is a very insightful uh, answer. and. Uh... What do you think is the risk profile of uh, taking an absolutely novel target uh, into early stage preclinical uh, and uh, how often does it succeed? Well, that's, uh, this is a special year to ask that question actually, Alex, because in, in certain areas, there's complete ability to do that. 
COVID-19 has demonstrated categorically that large companies, Pfizer particularly, AstraZeneca, uh, really were willing to jump in and go into completely novel targets and to develop things in a completely novel way. So it's not as if they can't be done, it can be done. There are some that have failed, even Sanofi GSK were not successful, but they too jumped in. Now they all saw the imperative to jump in. There is, a, there is the ability to do this in a large company. It needs both a push and a pull. They need to see that the technologies are there. They need to have the desire to really go at it. And so I think if one was to transfer everything we learned about COVID-19 to cancer, to CNS, to uh, all, all sorts of different diseases, and I hope we do, there will be a desire and a belief that in fact, innovation is the core engine of the pharmaceutical industry and that they can do it. And I believe that the top leaders of the companies that are big companies will understand this, or at least most of them. So actually you touched on a very interesting topic. So COVID-19, uh, we know that uh, we're, we're pretty much nearing the anniversary of when it was called the global pandemic. Uh, I think that same time uh, last year, uh, it was already, uh, you know, going full scale. So end of January, we realized that it's, it's a problem. Very few people realized that it's going to stay with us. Uh, but around this time last year, we, we already knew about this problem and we do not see um, any effective drugs on the market, so new drugs or even drugs in clinical trials. I know that there is one, uh, so Pfizer is taking some very old molecule for C3-like protease into phase one, but so far that's the only one I know. Uh, most other experiments are repurposing, so of course they are trying, but I haven't seen any single uh, success in the clinic so far. Why do you think that is the case? Well, a couple of things. First of all, I'd like to break that down into several points. You are right. We knew. That means we, the industry, knew. This time, one year ago, in actual fact, the then administration was telling Bio and myself to our face that there wasn't a problem and that this was a political fake news issue and that nothing would occur. Now, you should understand that industry didn't believe that. Industry went straight at it. And industry got together. The pharmaceutical industry said, no, our responsibility is to patients. And in a way which is quite remarkable, here a little less a year ago, there was no vaccine. Yesterday, I had my second shot for the Moderna vaccine. Now, that is unbelievable, unbelievable. There has never been anything like that. Your question, though, is not that. I just want to make the point. One year ago, the administration was denying the existence of a problem. The industry did not. It went ahead, and as a result of the really great efforts of these companies, there is a drug. There is a vaccine. Now, you ask about drugs. This is very important. Actually, there were over 800 different programs started up. The bulk of those, 400 were exactly your point, repurposing. And you and I examined very closely the fake news around at least one of these, which was hydroxychloroquine. There were others, there are many others that have been tried out. But some of these repurposed drugs may show effect. Of their re remaining 600 or thereabouts, there are a little bit less than that, about 400 actually, about 300 are remaining vaccine programs and 300 are roughly small molecule programs. And some of these small molecule programs have definitely entered the clinic. We will get those results, I'm confident, within the next three to four months. So I think they're, they're definitely behind the vaccines, uh, but that was anticipated. They took a little time to start. I think to your question, why was it difficult for them, more difficult than for the vaccines? Well, the vaccines would, as a well-trod path for how you generate an antigen, 
mRNA was a revolution in that area though, you have to confess that. But we knew what we were trying to get, an antibody response. Now in the antivirals, we have to un unpackage the viral genome. We have to understand how we can interfere with it and its replication. That's a much more difficult task. And I believe though, that task will be unraveled and we'll learn a lot about not just this virus, but other viruses. But it's just a little slower and I'm fairly confident by the middle of this year, we'll have results to begin to demonstrate that. Uh, fantastic. And uh, um, so I've shown you uh, some data from our program where we have uh, novel target, novel molecule, broad disease indication. So uh, what do you think? How cool is that? <laughs> What's your opinion? Well, it's definitely cool. It's even better than cool. It's really interesting. I, I think the coming of age of AI in drug discovery and development is critical. And what you're demonstrating here is a really important fundamental fact that it's not enough just to be able to find the target. You have to link it to the biology. Not only do you have to link it to the biology, you then have to dis you have to test it against different hypotheses to ensure that you have something that could be a viable drug. And I think your program, without really diving into it, and I'll let you do that, is one where for the first time I've ever seen a program which takes from the inception a concept evaluates a completely novel target, then self-criticizes itself, puts forward hypotheses as to what kind of a drug you might want, then analyzes that drug, and finally does the crucial step of linking it to biology. Without that link to biology, all of these easy concepts of writing an AI program, finding a novel target, are not material. It requires a complete linkage an interdigitation of all of the pieces, which is so difficult. And to underestimate that difficulty, in my opinion, is to downplay the technology. So it's AI is super cool. No ifs, ands, or buts. Super cool. But the really clever thing here is the integration with biology and the ability to show that it will have an effect on a living organism. And that is what's crucial. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, I have no further questions, and uh, I think that yeah, for this interview we've got uh, uh, everything captured. So I uh, will pause the recording here.